Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute's Fall Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Billy D. Brown. I'm a research faculty here with GTMI, as well as Director of Manufacturing Education Programs. Uh, GTMI is one of 11 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes that uniquely focuses on manufacturing, research, development, and deployment. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist partners in moving innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment like located on main campus for basic research, uh, as well as nearby on 14th Street for more applied research at our advanced manufacturing pilot facility. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia and government, and thought leadership. GTMI hosts the Lunch and Learn series, uh, Lunch and Learn lecture series each semester. This fall, sessions will be held every Monday at noon as live online events. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, uh, undergraduate and graduate level students and researchers, as well as um, a, glowing, a growing global manufacturing community. Um, and we're here basically to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a smooth presentation experience, um, all audience members are automatically muted. If you have questions or comments for the speaker, please use the Q&A panel um, that's on the side of your screen. Uh, I, sh I strongly encourage everyone to go ahead and, and ask those questions as soon as, soon as you have them formulated and the speaker will address them at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Nicole Diamantides, uh, who will discuss 3D bioprinting and the manufacturing of engineered tissues. Uh, uh, Dr. Nicole Diamantides is a bioprinting, a bioprinting field application scientist at Cell Inc., a leading bioprinting company. Uh, she joined Cell Inc. in 2019 after completing her PhD at Cornell University. At Cornell, Nicole worked on the development of novel collagen bioink formulations for bioprinting cartilage and uh, collaborated with uh, Histogenics Corporation to mechanically characterize their investigational cartilage tissue implants. Nicole received her bachelor's in uh, biomedical engineering from Bucknell University and her master's and PhD in biomedical engineering from Cornell University. In today's session, Nicole will highlight how 3D bioprinting can be used to address some of the challenges in the manufacturing of engineered tissues. Welcome, Nicole. You may begin your presentation. Great, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so as Billy Dee said, today I'm gonna be talking about bioprinting, which is uh, an area I care deeply about. Um, and how bioprinting can be used for manufacturing engineered tissues. Uh, so just a little bit of background on Cellink, the company I work for. Um, so we're relatively new. We were just established in 2016, but in the last four years, we've uh, developed collaborations and have customers in over 60 countries across six continents. We're still waiting on Antarctica. Uh, we have nine offices across the globe uh, both in North America, Europe, and uh, Asia. We've expanded to over 200 employees and our customers um, have our products in over a thousand labs across the globe. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on selling bioprinting family. And I just wanna highlight here that we offer several different kinds of bioprinters and we'll go into kind of what these different kinds are later in the presentation. Um, but just to highlight that we have these different printers basically for different scale, different application area, um, different needs of that kind. And so there are a lot of different application areas that our printers are being used for. Um, everything from making lab grown meat uh, to soft robotics. Um, but today we're going to be focusing um, on tissue engineering. And bioprinting, really, it started as a fabrication method for creating tissue engineered products. And so what, beyond just bioprinting being a fabrication method, what exactly is tissue engineering in general? Um, and the end goal of tissue engineering is to engineer a living tissue. So how exactly do you go about doing that generally? Um, and the process starts with having cells. 
Um, and these cells are combined with some kind of scaffold, something to give them structure. And when you combine these things, you create something called a construct. But that construct is not quite yet a tissue. Um, so what actually needs to happen is that that construct basically needs time for the cells to really remodel their environment to you know, produce the proteins and other components that they would normally have in the body. And so with that kind of time and different um, culture conditions, constructs can just naturally, naturally I'll say in quotes, naturally become living tissues. And having that living tissue in the lab is all well and good, but the real end goal of tissue engineering is to create a therapy. So for that, you actually need to have a way to take this living tissue that you've created in a lab setting and actually deliver it to a patient. And so that's something where this field has not quite, you know, put much emphasis on quite yet. Um, we're still in very, fairly early stages um, in a lot of these regards. But this is kind of the general workflow. You're starting with, you know, your raw materials, your cells, biomaterials. You're working through the process to create a construct, which will then become a living tissue, which, if it can be delivered to a patient, can actually provide a therapy. And in this case, a therapy would be something that can restore function, can um, reduce pain. Depending on the tissue you're talking about, the effect of the therapy will be different. So, for example, you could have people who are burn victims um, who need tissue engineered skin, um, and that's going to serve multiple purposes of, you know, reducing pain, restoring function, even an aesthetic function in the case of skin. Um, but you also have people, for example, who have heart attacks, who now have um, diseased tissue in their hearts that need to be, in this case, replaced. So creating tissue engineered heart tissue can be used as a therapy for people who have suffered from heart attacks. And the list really goes on. Any you know, injury due to trauma, uh, disease, um, genetic malformations, all of these things can be treated potentially with tissue engineered items. And so once we figure out how do we do this on a lab scale, how do we do this and actually have something that will have an effect in a patient, how do we start to think about what needs to be done to scale that up um, on a mass scale? So if you think about if you're able to, in a lab, create a, a tissue engineered piece of cartilage, there are millions of people with osteoarthritis who, you know, will likely one day need some kind of joint replacement surgery. But what if instead a tissue engineered cartilage could solve that problem? Well, now we have millions of people needing this product. We need millions of the product. How do we make these tissue engineered products at scale? And we don't quite know how to do that. We don't even know how to do it necessarily on a small scale. But some of the areas where we really need to think about how to address these hurdles, I'm going to highlight here. Um, for example, we start just you know, right at the beginning. How do we culture the cells? What cells are we going to be using? For the scaffolds, what biomaterials are we going to be using? Where are they coming from? How do we actually combine those two things, the cells and the biomaterials, into a construct? How do we fabricate it? And once we figure out how to fabricate it, how do we culture that so we can most efficiently turn this construct from kind of just this thing in the lab into actual living tissue. And lastly, how do we actually get this now living tissue to the patient? Really, that is going to be the key in all this. You know, having something working in the lab is always one thing, but actually getting it into the real world and to the patient in need is the most important part. So I'm just going to go through this kind of stepwise in order. Um, so looking at cell culture, some of the areas we need to think about um, are the source of the cells, how differentiated these cells are, how many cells do we need, what kind of media will be used. And some of those kind of factors we need to think about, if we think about cell source, start. So for example, we can use either autogenic or allogenic cells. So autogenic means that these cells are actually coming from the individual patient who will eventually be implanted with this tissue. And the advantage of using these kinds of cells is that because they start from the patient, you have no risk of an immune response. So they're very safe to use in that regard, but unfortunately they can be difficult to harvest, especially at the potential cell number that's needed. Um, so you might know about how some burn victims will actually be treated by taking healthy skin from a different part of the body. But you're limited to how much healthy tissue there is. You can't just take it all. 
Um, so all of those kinds of factors need to be considered um, when determining cell source. Uh, conversely, if you use allogenic cells, these are cells that come from a different donor human. Um, you can get much more because you can combine them from different donor sources. So you can get an adequate cell number relatively easily. If these are coming from recently deceased donors, that means that you are able to kind of harvest whatever tissue or cell type you need with relative ease. But because this is now coming from a different person, that means that whatever you then implant into the patient in the future is going to have some risk of an immune response. So similar to anyone who might receive a, an organ donation now, they often need to take immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of their life, and there's still a risk of organ rejection. And all of that's just due to the fact that the, the donation, the organ, is coming from a different person. So you have the same risk in this case. Another question we have to consider is the type of cell. Are they differentiated or not? So we can have somatic cells, which basically just means these are cells that have a defined function, so a skin cell, a nerve cell, a liver cell, you know, all have very defined function, um, as opposed to something like a stem cell that can become any cell type, uh, theoretically. And the advantage of somatic cells is that, you know, they already have the function you want them to have. So if I want to create liver, I can start with a liver cell. That's pretty easy to do. Um, but Let's stick with the liver example. That means I need to biopsy those cells from the liver. Um, so they're difficult to kind of actually access and harvest. Stem cells um, also can be difficult to harvest, difficult to access. There's limited sources and there's some, you know, laws regarding their use. Um, if you're talking about embryonic stem cells, that can become an issue. Um, but the advantage to stem cells is that you can start with one source and then decide later, you know, what type of tissue with this. Um, so you have some guidance that you can you can imbue. And really where I think there's a lot of potential is in induced stem cells. So these are cells that start as somatic cells. They're treated in a certain way so that they actually kind of go backwards and become stem cells. You could then, you know, decide which new cell they're going to become. So you can say start with something like a skin cell, de-differentiate it back into a stem cell, start with a skin cell, de-differentiate to a stem cell, and then re-differentiate later into something like a liver cell. So you can basically create liver cells from a much more accessible tissue. So things like skin, fat, blood, things that are very easy to kind of get a sample of from the body, especially if you're considering a living donor. Um, it's very easy to get skin or blood draw. Um, Liposuction produces lots of fat cells that can be used for these kinds of applications. So this is something where you can have a readily accessible cell supply. And then with this you know, induced stem cell technology, you can then turn that type of cell into whatever your actual tissue of interest is. So that's something that I think has a lot of potential in this area. And the other factor to consider is in regards especially to cell number is expansion. So Whatever you produce, you're going to need some number of cells in your final construct. And can you harvest those from the beginning? Um, or do you need to actually give those cells time to grow and multiply and become the number of cells you need? And this is, you know, it's advantageous in that you can start with a small number of cells and then just give it some time and culture and they'll just become the number you need. Just naturally, they'll divide into however many you need. Um, but that means that you need to give them the time to do that. You need to give them the space and the facilities. For example, having all of the incubators, you can see in this image, just stacks and stacks of these kinds of culture plates. Um, in incubators, you need all of that media, that red pink liquid, all that media that's going to be, you know, feeding the cells. So, and that's the media itself can actually be one of the most, uh, one of the most expensive components in these kinds of cultures. So. You know, how much time do you give it to expand versus how much starting material you can get is another consideration that needs to be made. So those are some of the considerations just for, you know, how do we even get these cells to begin with? Uh, next, we're going to look at, you know, what kinds of biomaterials can be considered and why might you use some of these? So with biomaterials, we're just going to focus on kind of source of materials. So you have things like Synthetic materials, natural, are ones that are actually derived from the extracellular matrix, so the actual 
environment that the cells um, are in naturally. And beyond just, you know, what type of material you're using, there's a lot of other properties that need to be considered um, to actually make this a feasible material to use for these kinds of applications. And I'm going to go into more of that later when I focus on, on bioprinting specifically. But in terms of the actual type of material, there's some consideration. So, for example, with synthetic materials, because these are, you know, man-made, made in the lab, they're just reliant on chemistry. So as long as you're combining, you know, the same chemistry, you're going to get more or less the exact same product. So you have very minimal batch-to-batch -batch variation. But unfortunately, these materials are not the best for cells. You know, best case scenario, they don't kill the cells, and that's really as good as it can get. Um, so these are not always ideal for things that are going to be implanted in the body that we ideally would really want to turn into, you know, actually have this implanted tissue just integrate completely with the body. Synthetic materials aren't necessarily able to do that well. We also have natural materials. These are often derived from plant sources. Um, and because of that, you know, you're pretty easy to get in large quantities. Um, for example, things like seaweed or algae you can produce in kind of large quantities um, and then harvest. And these are cell compatible. So you can actually embed cells within these kinds of materials and the cells will live. Will live. Um, but the only downside is that we're often using plant based materials with mammalian or animal cells. And basically what that means is that they don't quite communicate the same way that animal cells communicate with animal materials. Um, so I'm calling it a cell binding site. So basically naturally in the body, cells would bind to their matrix, um, and they're not able to do that with these plant-based materials. So that's where we have extracellular matrix-drive materials, and these are actually coming from tissues to begin with, so often animal sources, um, like I have little mouse or cow, so things like cow dermis um, or rat tails are sources of different proteins in the matrix that can then be used to create these biomaterials. Um, and they're very cell friendly. They very accurately replicate the native environment of the cells. So the cells behave, you know, most naturally in these kinds of materials. But because they're coming from animal sources, this means they tend to be more expensive. And also because they're coming from animals, you know, you know, every cow is slightly different. So the, the collagen that you get from each one can vary slightly. So that means that your, your variability batch to batch can be a little higher than would be with um, other kind of lab grown materials. And the, the kind of growing area here um, is that some people are actually working on creating synthetic materials that accurately replicate the chemistry of extracellular matrix materials. So you can um, basically recombinantly make some of the proteins that you find in these tissues. And because you're doing this you know, recombinantly, it's more kind of considered synthetic, um, but it's but it's ending up making kind of a very similar end result. That might be kind of a good in between of having something that the cells, you know, recognize and can interact with, but can be created in a very controlled manner. So once we figure out what kind of cells we're using, what kind of biomaterials we're using, how do we actually physically combine these into a construct? How do we fabricate these constructs? So there are a lot of different methods that have been used to do this. I'm only highlighting a few here. Um, the first one being injection molding. I'm also going to talk about self-assembly, decellularization, recellularization, and bioprinting. So injection molding, uh, kind of what you would expect it to be, similar to how you would make a molded jello. You start with your mold, and then you're injecting some kind of liquid into this mold. You know, in the case of jello, you stick it in the fridge, let it set. And then you're able to just pull this solid now gel out of the mold. So you can see here you had your empty mold that you filled and you end up with actual your desired construct. And in this case, you'd be injecting some kind of usually a gel like material, um, like a hydrogel combined with cells so that what you end up with is a completely cellularized little construct. And the advantage here is because we're starting with a mold, we're able to create relatively complex 3D geometries. Um, but with this method, we're limited more or less to just one material. So you just inject one bulk material into these molds, 
and that usually has one cell type mixed within it. So you're not necessarily able to replicate the full complexity of different tissues. Um, and also because you're just kind of filling an entire mold, uh, it's difficult to create porosity or vascularization. So for most tissues, you need to have a blood supply to feed the cells. Um, with tissue engineered products, they're no different. They need some kind of way to get nutrients. And so creating vascularization or having porosity is a way to do that. But with these injection molding, you're ending up with one often solid construct. Um, so it's difficult for the cells in the center of that construct to really access the nutrients that are in the media flowing around the entire construct. And because of that, you're often limited with this technique to making either thin or smaller smaller constructs. So you're not able to do kind of the full, full organ um, products that might be of interest. Uh, another application is uh, self-assembly. So this is basically removing the biomaterials from the equation entirely and actually just starting with high concentration, so lots and lots of cells all together. And basically, if they're treated the same way, these cells will behave similar to how they do during embryogenesis. Um, so an embryo starts as just a ball of cells that differentiate into different tissues. So can we kind of take our understanding from embryogenesis to guide this bunch of cells into a certain tissue type. And there's a lot of research going on in time into you know, what kind of cues really need to be given to drive this process. But generally, you take these cells at a high concentration and just give them time and the right cues, they'll start to actually develop certain functionalities of a tissue. In this case, this is a, a kidney, um, kidney application using kidney cells. And you can see that it's creating renal vesicles and these nephron-like structures. So these are all things that you would find in our overall kidney, um, but that we're creating on a much smaller scale. So that's kind of the downside is that we haven't quite figured out how to create you know, full-scale organs using this method uh, without cells dying in the process. Um, so it's usually used to create what we call organoids, uh, which is our small organ-like constructs. Um, and these are usually more on the, the micro to millimeter scale, so definitely not something that we can use right now for creating actual, you know, full organ, large constructs. Uh, alternatively, we have decellularization, recellularization, which can be used to create actual full organs. So I have this little picture on the right. So this is a, a heart tissue. Um, and the way this process works is you start with a full heart, um, in this case, or whatever the organ or tissue is. It's then treated in such a way, cleaned, to remove all of the cellular material. So that's that's all the cells, that's all the bits of DNA left behind. Those are all washed away. And what you're left with is this white kind of ghost organ um, that's it's just the extracellular matrix. Um, so it's all of the structure, but none of the actual cell. And so what you can then do with this kind of ghost organ, um, it's basically just a scaffold now, so you can reseed it with, you know, whatever your cell of choice is to recreate this organ. And the advantage here is that because you're leaving all of the natural environment behind and just putting new cells back in the place of the old, you have a very close mimic of the actual natural environment. But unfortunately, this is difficult to scale, mostly because of the limitations on the supply of donor organs. So to start with a full heart means that you need to somehow access a full heart, and this often needs to be a healthy heart as well. Um, so if you know anything about the donor organ shortage, this is going to be the same same issue with this application. And there is some there is some work looking at you know maybe you know animal sources could be used for these kinds of applications, but that's something that's not quite um, fully investigated yet. Uh, and then the last application method is bioprinting, which very similar to traditional 3D printing, uh, where you, instead of just you know, laying down pieces of plastic layer by layer, you're laying down a hydrogel mixed with cells in a similar layer by layer. And I'm gonna go into much more detail about it in a, in a few slides. Okay, so once we figured out you know, how do we actually make these constructs, the real key is turning it into an actual living tissue. So what, how do we culture these constructs in such a way that the cells that we've embedded in this construct are actually able to turn their environment into a real tissue? And here we have things like controlling 
mechanical and chemical signaling. We also need to consider how are we going to monitor this process and how do we know when it's done? What are our endpoints? So again, the goal here is to create a mature implantable tissue. And so a lot of that means that you need to expose the cells that are in the construct to similar environments that they would be in in the body. So for example, we look at something like the cells in a blood vessel, the cells that are on the inside of blood vessels are constantly having fluid blood flow past them. They're constantly under shear stress. So we should therefore culture these cells with shear forces. So creating bioreactors that have perfusion of fluid across our cells so that the cells are experiencing what they experience in the body. Similarly, tissues like cartilage that are constantly being mechanically compressed, um, these can be cultured dynamically. So you have the similar forces being applied. In this case, this is that four little tissue engineered pieces of cartilage. You can compress them dynamically. That'll stimulate those cartilage cells to behave the way they would in the body and to produce the proteins and other components that they would normally be, be in. In addition to mechanical signals, we have chemical signals. So these can be growth factors, small molecules, peptides, drugs, um, all of these components that you basically can help dictate how the cells will behave. And in some cases, our goal is to replicate what they would experience in the body. Um, but it can also be, you know, we've learned some tricks just in the study of biology of how to accelerate things like growth, especially with growth factors. Um, so how do we um, accelerate these cells turning this construct into a tissue? Um, these can be useful. And this can also be when you differentiate cells. So if we had started with stem cells um, that we want to now turn into, say, skin cells, there are certain chemical signaling that they need to receive in order to go along that pathway to a skin cell. And the other side of this is, you know, monitoring. How do you know what these cells are doing? And then how do you know when it's done? What, what actually is your endpoint? And so monitoring, uh, most of our processes are destructive. So you can see these images I have on the right. These are all samples that have been, you know, taken out of culture, fixed, frozen, sliced, stained, treated, all these things that basically now destroy the construct itself. So to do these kinds of tests in a production facility, that means that maybe for every sample that becomes a tissue that can be implanted, we need, you know, five to ten just sacrificial shams just to test where our cells are, how they're behaving in that actual sample that's, that's going to end up in a patient. And so there's a real need for figuring out how do we non-destructively assess and monitor these constructs. So there's some things you can do um, just by looking at the media component. So media, that solution that's being bathed in, needs to be replaced every so often. And when you take it out, you can, the components that are in the media can kind of tell you some things about what the cells are doing. But you can only learn so much just from the media. So it's not really the end all. It's, you can't get everything from that. Um, but there are other, other techniques, especially light-based spectroscopy that's growing, um, which could potentially, you know, give you an idea of what the composition of these constructs are over time. So you can see on the right here, I had an example. So this is, you know, the initial scaffolds really with cells that have just been seeded. And over time, the cells are producing this, in this case, a red uh, matrix component. And with more time and culture, they're producing more and more of it. And so how do you assess, you know, how much matrix has been made non-destructively? Um, so maybe something like spectroscopy could be used for that application. But again, you also need to consider how do you even know when it's done? Um, what is, you know, implantable? How do you know when it can come out of culture? And some people might say you need to perfectly mimic the native tissue. So here you can see this is actual uh, native intact human skin. And then going down, we have our construct over time, which, you know, with time more and more starts to better replicate that native tissue. You see more of this dark purple region, you see more uh, thicker top layer with this kind of medium pink color. But even after 20 days, you know, it's nothing really like this human skin. So how close do we need to be um, is something that no one really quite knows yet. Um, so figuring out what endpoints are, is it just a certain amount of time and culture? And after that much time, we just say, you know, it must be ready. 
is that when it's reached a certain mechanical strength, you know, for example, if something like cartilage or skin, it needs to be able to withstand certain forces. So once it, you know, reaches that strength, then we're done. Are we looking for certain matrix components? Are we looking for a certain cell number? Are we looking for the tissue to respond to drugs or other stimuli in a repeatable way? So, for example, if we were doing something like a pancreas, we might say we'll expose it to sugar and then look at how much insulin is produced. And if it meets a certain threshold, then it's done. Um, but again, these are all things that we don't have the, the end all answer for yet um, and, and really need to be to be figured out on a small scale before we can figure out how do you do this and mass. So once we do figure out, you know, all of these questions, we now have our living tissue in a lab in the production facility. Now, what do we do to actually get it to the patient? Um, and here we have questions related to, you know, storage, temperature, how long can they be stored or transported? Um, and then a real big question is if it's going to be, you know, something that's ready off the shelf, um, just kind of a generic versus something that's made to order custom. So with temperature, if something is kept fresh, so cells are basically sensitive to extremes. Um, you heat them up too much, they'll die. Cool them down too much, they can die. So having them be fresh, or basically you keep them in culture at body temperature until they're ready, and then you know chill them slightly and get them to the patient. Um, again, fresh. Uh, that could be a potential method, but that means you really don't have the ability to store store the sample at all. So as soon as it's ready, it needs to be transported more or less. As opposed to if it can be frozen, if it can be, you know, finishes culture, you say it's done, I can freeze it and just leave it in storage for X amount of time until, you know, the patient is ready, until the doctor's ready, and then I can deliver it. So those are, you know, which way is best for the cells, which way is best for, you know, scaling this process, it's unclear. Um, and time is a big factor here. You know, how long between the construct being ready and the patient being ready? How do you time those two events to coincide? Um, how long is this tissue viable, either frozen or fresh? You know, what is that window that you have to work with to actually deliver this product? Um, and potentially, you might need to actually coordinate that your production facility is geographically close to where the patients are going to be, or you need to be able to bring patients to the production facility. Um, so that having that geographical question can be important. And once we kind of figure out what is the best method, what is the best temperature, you know, the cold chain logistics are very well fleshed out for other industries. So the infrastructure is definitely there for us to work with. It's just we need to figure out um, as an industry, what are the best practices? And then lastly, you know, are these generic or are they patient specific? So um, I like this little example in the top. Um, so something that's coming from allogenic cell sources, so not from the patient themselves, but from just a healthy donor. This could be an off the shelf product where, you know, at any point in time, you can harvest cells from a donor, go through most of the production process, and then just put them in storage. And then once you identify a patient, then you can take it out of storage, you know, thaw it if it's been frozen, Seed it with the patients, or sorry, so then you can actually deliver it to the patient in, in question. So this just gives you some more flexibility in terms of timing your production with when the patient is actually in need. And especially if you're considering uh, therapies for traumatic injuries, things that are unpredictable potentially, having the ability to produce things and have them ready just off the shelf could be advantageous. Alternatively, if you want to create a product that is patient specific. So either having a very specific geometry or having actually the patient's own cells, that means you can't start really the production process until you've identified the patient. And then that patient needs to wait however long it takes to produce and culture before they can actually receive this therapy. Um, so this just kind of changes the timeline of when production happens, relative to delivery. In the case of it being patient specific, if you can time it right, you don't need to worry about storage. You can have it be ready and immediately deliver to patient. Um, but again, that means you just need to, you know, everyone's schedules are unpredictable. So if you tell a patient, you know, six, from, six months from now, your tissue engineer product will be ready to implant. Make sure you have your OR schedule done. 
um, you know, that's just not always realistic. So having some wiggle room in those kinds of schedules will also be important. As we move forward in figuring out how to create these tissue engineered products, how do we create these therapies that are actually functional and are actually therapeutic, create therapeutic effects, uh, we really need to think about how what we're doing kind of in the research stages now will impact what will happen when we think about production stages later. So, you know, we can create, you know, this great tissue engineered liver, but if there's no way to do it in mass, it's really not going to have the therapeutic effect that everyone would want. So these are the questions that are important to really think about now um, before the field really, you know, gets too far, um, just to make sure that we're, we're considering the future and how this will scale up um, from the get-go. So with that, I want to now shift focus a bit to bioprinting and how I think it can be used really, um, it can be really advantageous both in producing tissue engineered products, you know, on the lab scale and potentially creating them um, on a manufacturing scale in the future. So there are different kinds of bioprinting. I'm highlighting a few here, extrusion, inkjet, and stereolithography. Um, so these all are you know, slightly different. They have different um, advantages and disadvantages. Here at Cellink, we do offer both or all types, really, extrusion-based and light-based. And there's reasons to use one over the other. Um, extrusion-based, you're able to extrude um, a hydrogel or bio ink using pressure or mechanical forces to build something up kind of line by line or filament by filament. Um, and with light-based, depending on the system you're using, a light or optic system uh, to selectively cure a bath of resin. Um, and if it's a projection-based system, you can do this layer by layer. Um, or if it's a laser-based system, you can actually do it on a very fine point resolution. Um, so depending on what the application is, you know, you might pick one type of printing over another. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing on extrusion printing. And this is because it has the ability to use multiple materials. You can use a wide range of material properties within the same construct, and it can be used to create relatively large constructs in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so kind of some of the advantages of bioprinting and some of them you can see being actually applied in this little video. Bioprinting allows you to use multiple materials. Um, so in the case of this BioX bioprinter being highlighted here, we can use up to three materials in the same print. And we're also able to use a wide range of material you know, types. So you can have something that's a very you know, low viscosity with something that's very high viscosity, all within the same construct. You're also able to print uh, with multiple cell types. So most tissues are not, you know, encompassed by just one cell type, even if something as what's theoretically as simple as a piece of skin, it's not just skin cells. Um, there's fibroblasts and keratinocytes and dermal fibroblasts um, that all have slightly different properties and functions. So being able to really accurately mimic the cell types and where they are um, is important. And with bioprinting, because you're basically using 3D printing technology, you're able to create very complicated 3D geometries. Um, and with you've seen any you know, organs in the body, those are not necessarily circles and squares. They're very complicated shapes. Um, so we're able to mimic those kinds of geometries with this technology. And what I think is really advantageous is that with this, you can actually control which materials and which cells are placed where within this overall construct. Um, so for example, uh, I'm going to be kind of highlighting the ear for the next few slides. So the ear has a, a certain tissue type down at the bottom of the lobe. It's kind of more of a fatty tissue versus up at the top. It's more of a cartilaginous tissue, and there's different cell types in each. And with 3D printing, you can create both this overall complex ear geometry, where you can have different cells and different material properties for this bottom region versus this top region. And you can do that all kind of in one print session. There's no you know, repeating processes or anything like that. And because this is a uh, you know, robotic system, it's very easy to automate. There's very little human interaction that's needed. Um, so for, for scale up, that's pretty important. So a little bit more detail on kind of what this overall process is. So you start with um, your actual blueprint, the, the 
computer model or code that's going to be used. You combine that with, you know, your physical bio ink, your biomaterial and your cells. Bring those both to the printer, hit print. Printer does all the hard work of extruding this material in your defined geometry. There's often some kind of cross-linking step, which is just a, that's where you're putting your jello in the fridge, um, that cross-linking going from more of a liquid-like material to going to more of a solid-like material. And then from there, you can move forward to the, the construct culture step where we're actually turning this, you know, fabricated construct into a living tissue, letting the cells do most of that hard work. So a little bit um, more detail on the, the blueprint process here. So the advantage here is that we can actually get these models from a variety of sources. So things like medical imaging, MRI and CT scans, 3D photography, or just you know regular CAD software, AutoCAD, SolidWorks can be used to create these 3D models. And the advantage here is really for creating patient-specific geometries. So if we're sticking with the ear example, there is a genetic condition some children are born with where they actually are missing or have a deformed external ear. Um, and so if we wanted to create a new ear for them, what we're actually able to do is image their healthy, undeformed ear and create a perfect mirror image so that their ears are you know, specific to them, they're a perfect match, aesthetically pleasing. Um, we're able to do that with relative ease using this bioprinting technology because we'll, we'll image it using whatever you know, imaging method whichever modality, and then we're just using computer software to take that 3D model, and if you're at all familiar with 3D printing, it's the same as that process of taking a 3D model, you slice it into layers, and you define what the infill, what the kind of internal region of each layer is going to look like. So here on the right, this is an example of one layer of this ear print. So we have the, the perimeter for this layer and how the, the actual nozzle itself will move to fill in that space with material. And then here we have, if you actually stacked all these layers together, what does this final print look like? And so that's the general process for creating these, you know, the blueprint, the computer side of this process. And then the other side, relatively more complicated, is the actual biomaterials and cells themselves. And as I kind of highlighted previously, you know, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered in terms of cell culture, cell source, um, biomaterial source. And here at Cell Inc, we actually began as a bio ink or biomaterial company. So we do have a lot of expertise in this area. Um, so I had said, you know, cell or biomaterial source is important. You can see that these are some of the different components that we use for our own bio inks. And that we do use a combination of synthetic, natural, and extracellular matrix derived materials um, to create our inks. And this is just a little sampling of some of the different formulations we've created just to kind of show that, you know, there's no one right answer. Um, everyone, depending on the cell type, the exact application, they have different needs. And so different formulations are able to kind of fulfill different needs. Um, and just a little highlight beyond just the cell source, some of the properties uh, that these biomaterials need to have, you know, they need to have certain hydration just for, you know, our bodies mostly water cells are used to be in a very water-like environment so these materials need to have that same property ideally they need to be able to to degrade so that the cells can actually you know replace this implanted tissue um, with native tissue so the ideal is that you know with once this has been implanted into a patient the patient's own body will integrate it all together and replace it so that it's you know becomes one whole it's no longer an implant and then native tissue it's actually just completely healed and you need that material to be able to degrade to do that. For bioprinting, you need to have certain viscosities. So you need just certain uh, material behavior in order to actually physically print these materials. Uh, we talked a bit about cross-linking. You know, you need a method to basically go from material that can be squeezed out of a nozzle, something more liquid-like, to something that can be, you know, handled, something more solid. Ideally, you want cell adhesion. Um, so that's, you know, the cell binding sites I had mentioned previously, where you need a way for the cells to actually interact with this environment rather than just kind of sitting there idle in a ball. And that needs to be mechanically stable. So one, it needs to have enough stability that the cells can, or that the surgeon themselves can, can handle it so that it can be, you know, taken from culture, moved into a different incubator, transported to the physician, 
um, and then actually the physician handling it to get it implanted in the person. And then once it's implanted in the patient, um, then it also being mechanically stable to withstand whatever forces it's experiencing. So if we're talking about, you know, a tissue engineered cartilage, you know, if it's going to be put down, put in the knee, that needs to be able to withstand all the forces the knee generates just from normal, you know, daily movement. So those are all the factors that, you know, go into designing different bioinks and biomaterials and kind of just to show that, you know, this field has a lot of work to do um, just to kind of hit these areas. And, you know, we haven't found the one perfect material to do this quite yet, um, but that it's an area that we at Cellink and, you know, researchers across the world are working on. So just a little kind of why I think bioprinting in particular is a very promising fabrication method. Uh, for tissue engineering, especially when, especially when we look to scale this process up. Um, so the ability to create custom and patient-specific geometries, you know, without needing to retrofit, you know, manufacturing lines, without needing different molds, it can all be done using the same exact processes. You know, every time you just, you know, input a different CAD file and you get a different shape at the end. And this process also has very little, you know, human involvement, human interaction. So you're minimizing you know, the risk of human error, human contamination. Um, it's very easy to interface these printers with things like robotic arms on assembly lines. And I think one of the real advantages is actually the ability to create kind of the most complex structs you can. So you basically need little to no time of construct culture to go from the construct stage to the tissue stage. So because I can create um, these three-dimensional organs or tissues with different cell types in different regions, with different material properties in different regions, I can more accurately mimic, you know, the final tissue, um, you know, tissue environment without having to give it as much time and culture for the cells to kind of do their work. Uh, kind of, you know, kind of gets, gets the ball rolling a little faster. The cells don't have to put in as much work to get that final product. So this will save you time, save media, um, save, you know, resources in terms of facility space. Um, so that's something that I think will be really advantageous moving forward. But of course, we know we're not there yet. Um, biggest issue in terms of anything that's going to be used um, as a therapy is regulatory approvals um, and also things like parallelization. So right now we have one BioX can print one construct in X amount of time. So if I want to print 100, do I need 100 BioXs, or is there a way to parallel, parallelize these printers so that you can have multiple going at once without having actually different physical machines? It's actually incorporating them into more of a manufacturing assembly line setup. And I do want to highlight um, ARMY, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute. Um, they're in New Hampshire. So they, you know, their whole goal is to answer the questions I've been talking about today. Um, and they created the tissue foundry, which is basically they're kind of starting to create an assembly line process. What would this look like on an assembly line to create a tissue engineered product? Um, so if you have, you know, interest in this area, I highly recommend checking. Um, and then just again, yeah, closing on selling. So we're a bioprinting company, but we also have products in liquid handling, single cell printing, live cell imaging. Um, so if you have you know, any interest in those kinds of applications, let me know. And additionally, we just acquired two new companies, uh, Cyanion and Selenium, and they actually have expertise in creating kind of manufacturing scale equipment and workflows for, you know, therapeutic um, pharmaceutical applications mostly. So we're really excited for seeing how we can kind of combine our expertise for this exact application of how do you create, you know, a manufacturing scale bioprinting system. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully we have more news on that in the coming, you know, months and years. Uh, so that, thank you all for your time. If you're interested in, you know, learning more about this, Cellink is also hosting our own webinars. So you can check out our website to learn more about that. Um, I think we've got some time for questions here. Um, but if anyone you know, doesn't get their question in, feel free to email me. Email's there. Um, but otherwise, thank you all. Thank you so much, Nicole, for a fascinating presentation. Um, I think it was a, a great overview of the biofabrication process um, and, and it gives us some insight on, on what uh, Cell Inc. is doing as well there at the end. Um, 
So um, yeah, we, we definitely have some questions that are coming in, um, but I just wanted to just thank you for your, for, for your time and for um, a wonderful presentation. Um, so <clears throat> we, first we have a question um, from Alexander Chin. He, he's asking, can you control the temperature of the dye printing tip? Um, he's asking because he's wondering if he can use LCST polymer for the hydrogel scaffold printing. Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what the LCST polymer is, but yes, we do have temperature control throughout the printing process. Um, so our, our, depending on if it needs to be heated or cooled, we have different print heads to control the temperature of the, the, the biomaterial in the cartridge and the print head all the way down to the actual nozzle tip. And we also have temperature control of the print bed itself. Excellent, excellent. We have a question here. It says, during the manufacturing of certain autologous product, if the company was told that the patient will need to postpone the treatment for a certain amount of time, um, could the, would the intermediate product be able to be stored for a certain amount of time and then you can continue to production later? Yeah, so that's a great question and one that, you know, it's really dependent on exactly, you know, what fabrication methods you're doing, what biomaterials you're using. So um, the cells themselves can often be cultured um, or frozen. Um, so if I've already, you know, taken cells from a, um, from a patient, I can freeze them to kind of just put them in stasis for a time and then I can restart the process later. But if I've already, you know, fabricated a construct and I'm now have it in culture, you know, becoming a tissue, there's, it's more difficult to kind of just pause that process. You're more likely to need to either, um, if you're able to, you know, at the end of all of it, store it for a time frozen, um, that would be the time to do it. But for the, for constructs that need to be delivered fresh, you're really not able to, to really have that kind of pause. You might actually have to start back from the beginning. Okay, Nicole, we have a few questions from Dr. Kevin Wong. Um, he says, thank you for the great lecture. And he noticed they're both autologous and allergenic tissue products for the same tissue. What factors determine a tissue product should be autologous or allergenic or allergenic? And what are the advantages and limitations of autologous and allergenic tissue products? Yeah, so you can definitely have either source at this point. You know, if I take cartilage cells from the patient versus cartilage cells from a donor, for most of the processing, you treat everything the same. So you can start with either. The real question is if that implant is going to be have any kind of immune response. So, you know, if, if you're going to be using an allogeneic cell source, you're going to have to have some kind of immunosuppressive therapy for the patient, which for a lot of people is not an ideal, you know, solution. Um, people don't want to be on these drugs for the rest of their lives. Um, and additionally, you don't want to have the risk of rejecting this implant. Um, so that's where autologous sources have, you know, some advantages, but the issues with autologous sources is actually just getting the cells to begin with um, can be challenging. So you know, there's no, again, there's no right answers. No one's figured it all out yet. So people are trying and seeing, you know, what way can work best, but uh, we're still figuring it out. Uh, one more question from Kevin. He's, he says, is there a rule of thumb for the cell density on the construct and at the end of in vitro cell expansion? Yeah, so that's something that, again, people are still figuring it out. Um, a lot of people kind of take the embryogenesis route. So in embryogenesis, it's all about having really densely clustered cells. You want a lot of cells together. So a lot of people will use, you know, a very high cell density on their constructs just to kind of mimic that process. And also just the more cells you have, the more cells that can be producing matrix and can be turning this into a tissue. So it can make it, you know, more efficient, you know, culture. But the, the disadvantage there is that you then need to have some more starting material. So you need more cells to begin with, which if you're talking about autologous cells, it's hard to get that many cells. You might need to expand them, expanding, you know, expanding cells, increasing cell number can can introduce other complications um, and, and costs. So uh, it's a great question. Uh, things that people haven't, you know, there's no one best practice yet. 
Great. Okay. Um, right now, I don't see any further questions. Um, if you have a question, uh, please submit it right away, um, and uh, we'll see if we can answer it. If not, um, you can see Nicole's email is there, actually, and she said that you're welcome to email her any questions. Um, and I just want to uh, thank the audience right now for attending. Um, again, um, please spread the word about these lectures that are happening every Monday. Well, we still have several left. This was our second one on the topic of uh, manufactured uh, tissues. Um, and I think it, it went very well. It complemented the previous um, lecture very well. Um, here we have a question that's coming up. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Nicole. How does the mechanical stimulus affect the growth of constructs? Is the mechanical stimulus necessary for all tissue constructs? Yeah, so it really does depend on the on the type of tissue. So things like blood vessels and cartilage or bone, things that are you know normally experiencing different mechanical forces usually get the most benefit from having this kind of mechanical stimuli in culture. You know, something like a liver or a pancreas tissue, something that you know when they're in the body they don't experience much in terms of mechanical forces. They don't really need those kinds of stimuli to kind of behave the way we would want them to. So it's definitely something that's tissue specific. Um, and it can, if, you know, say if I started uh, mechanically compressing a liver tissue, you know, it could actually be detrimental. That could be, you know, a bad signal for those types of cells. So definitely something that you need to consider on a tissue by tissue basis. Uh, Nicole, actually, I have a quick question. How how is Cell Inc. working with Army Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute? Yeah, so we work with them um, kind of just broadly on more education type platforms. Um, just especially, they have a whole um, education and workforce development team just to get more young people even aware of this field and how they can you know, work in it. Um, but also we work with them to um, partner with other either academic labs or other companies um, to make different advances. So um, we have different collaborations that basically Army has been, you know, the connecting. They kind of connect us with other people who um, we can work with in this area. Excellent, excellent. And um, GTMI is, is certainly working with Army as well. So um, I, I look forward to further collaboration uh with with you as well as as well as army um awesome. i do want to remind the audience that we are recording the lectures um and i think i mentioned last time actually that i would um put this uh the recording site into the chat so i'm going to actually do that right right now um but it's basically uh manufacturing I'm um, actually posting it as a reply. Manufacturing.gotech.edu slash lectures. Let's see if I could put it. We actually don't have a chat here, guys. Um, it's just a Q&A panel, so I've posted it um, as a reply to questions. So maybe you guys can see that. Um, so right now we have the recordings for the last three lectures on that website. Um, so this one will will basically be there probably later this week. Um, the next session actually will will focus on um, composites manufacturing and uh, as well as joining and repair of composites. It'll be given by Professor Chuck Zhang here at uh, he's a, actually a GTMI affiliated faculty uh, next Monday. Uh, but since we have no further questions um, and it's almost one o'clock, I'm going to go ahead and. Um, you know, thank the speaker one more time. We appreciate it, Nicole, and we're going to go ahead and close. So um, I really appreciate everybody's time um, and, and continue to promote our series so that um, we can spread advanced manufacturing knowledge. We can all discuss these issues. Um, and and um, I'm just everybody I'm having, wishing everybody a fantastic Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you all.